Hey besties, if you care about your financial life and you're on Netflix and you've heard about the series How to Get Rich but you have not even bothered to watch it, I really don't know what to say because it is loaded with a lot of financial nuggets and in today's video, I am going to be sharing seven money lessons that I have learned from How to Get Rich. If you are seeing me for the first time, my name is Ada and I'm also known as The Legal Pepe. I release content on relocation and lifestyle, so do well to stay subscribed. How to Get Rich is a series on Netflix hosted by a man called Ramit. So in that series, basically, Ramit had six weeks to help people with their financial life. So the way it went was, people would come to Ramit and ask him about their financial life and he would guide them through the whole process so of course this video is not going to be a spoiler it's just me sharing the things i've learned so the first thing i learned is it is important to define what a rich life is for you so you watching me what is a rich life because from that series i learned that what a rich life is to you is going to be different from what a rich life is to me some people's rich life is for them to own homes for some people is luxury some people is comfort some people peace of mind for instance for someone like me a rich life includes me having time for myself like you see that lifestyle of people that maybe they become top executives where they're always so busy they don't have time for themselves and things they love now that is a rich life to somebody but for me, that's going to be like a very poor life because I want to have enough time to do anything I want to do and not having to be regimented to a certain life. So decide on what your rich life is to you because once you know what your rich life is, you will be able to make intentional decisions and actions. Especially if you are an immigrant, you need to know what your rich life is because if you don't know where you are going to see, people will drag you anywhere. And if you're not conscious of how you want your life to go, people will drag you anywhere. And the next thing, you've spent 10 years, 20 years doing things that other people wanted you to do without actually asking yourself what your rich life would be. So best is, what is your rich life? Your rich life does not have to be a luxury. It doesn't have to be you traveling every month. Your rich life could be as simple as you picking up your kids from school. It could be something quite basic. It doesn't have to be anything big. But the important thing is, when you are intentional about what your rich life is, it should even help you define what success means to you because we all have different definitions of what success is. Be with people that share similar financial values with you. And this is something that is very important to note, especially in a romantic setting. Well, even in friendships, it is important that the people around you actually share similar financial values with you. But more importantly, with respect to your romantic relationship, you have to be with people that actually share similar values with you. And you see all these arguments we have online. Oh, should a man go 50-50 with a woman? Should a man be the sole provider? Should a man do this? Should a woman do this? The reason why we keep having these back and forth online is because people are with people that share different financial values with them. And they start complaining that, oh, she did this, he did this. No, it is all you. Now, if you are married, of course, this is quite different because you've already gotten married and you actually should have gotten married to someone that shares the same values with you. But even in that setting, it is still possible to make some changes. But of course, if you're not married, like it's very important that your partner believes in what you believe in. I've been on both sides of the spectrum. By this, I mean, I have dated a man that believes in 50-50. And when I say 50-50, I mean 50-50, like equality financially. In his words, he calls it partnership. So to him, 
as a woman in his life you are a co-contributor so as you are making your money you are also using that same money to finance the relationship to finance like everything i have also dated a man that believes in hypergamy and with that he's a sole provider like once he's with you like you are his baby girl like you cannot be spending money something as little as maybe me wanting to buy biscuits he will give him money say no 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 no, no. you can't be with me and be spending your own money because if you're with me and you're spending your own money then why are you with a man now that's his mentality now having dated both i know which one i want <laughs> i know where i stand i know whose values i want to align with now imagine me being more self-aware now I'm not going to be doing test run. I just know what I want. Now, if I am a woman that believes in hypergamy, I can't date a man that believes in 50-50. It won't work because we we'll keep having clashes. In the same vein, if I'm a woman that believes in, oh, you know what? Equality on all grounds, like bring your money, I bring my money, we contribute. Imagine dating a man that believes that no, a woman should not spend money. In that scenario, I will start feeling like, oh, He's being disrespectful to me. He doesn't value. Like, I will just start feeling all these emotions. And that's why it is very important to date someone that believes in what you believe in. That way, you save a lot of friction. And truly, you will save the media a lot of drama. Like, we don't need all of that. And I learned this lesson from a couple in How to Get Rich, Amani and Matt. So, basically, the woman is a top executive. Whereas the man is an electrical engineer, but for the sake of the home, he became a stay-at-home dad. Now, being a stay-at-home dad, he expected some level of like control financially, or at least access. But the woman with the top executive felt that no, she's the one making the money, so she should not like be accountable to him. So basically, she wanted him to be the typical stay-at-home dad and she was not even giving him anything like an allowance or anything like that the man claimed that he felt useless because of course he was not bringing in money so he didn't even feel financially responsible and the woman on the other hand felt he had no right to be complaining after all it was at home and although she does not really give him money she foots the major bills in the house and i watched this and the first thought in my mind was how are they married now, obviously, they have very different financial values and yet they go married. They're not in the marriage, they're both in hands. Because that's what happens when you actually don't care about financial values. Because people say, oh, love is everything. Hmm. Okay now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because your values are very important. Like, when it comes to finances, people rarely talk about it. Couples rarely talk about it. They talk about love. They talk about um, other things. Would you cook for me when I wake you up by 2 a.m.? We talk about like very inconsequential things. But things like money, which is something that really breaks marriages and relationships. People shy away from that conversation. So besties, it is important to know what your own financial values are. Because when you know what your financial values are, you would actually know what to accept or not. And Rami has taught me about the fact that there is something called the psychology of money. We all have a psychology towards money and this could be based on our upbringing, what we grew up hearing money to be, what money represents to us. And once you know your philosophy surrounding money, it will guide you towards attracting someone that actually shares a similar value with you. And the third thing I learned which actually blew my mind was that owning a home may not be the best financial decision for you and when i heard that i'm like what because <laughs> of course for most immigrants once they come in here and they're able to get the ground running regarding the bills and all the jobs and all of that once they start getting their foot on this ground the next thing they think of is like getting a home getting a mortgage and for rami to say owning a home may not be the best financial decision it kind of threw me off balance because i'm like why like what <laughs> but i learned from this series that your rent is the maximum you would pay on a property but your mortgage is the minimum you would pay and you should never feel bad 
for renting because most times that mortgage is just the list of your concern because you will still have other bills that you will need to pay now ramit is not saying don't own a home he's saying before you own a home check if you actually can afford to own a home and he laid down three principles for you to decide now the first is are your total gross earnings less than 28 percent of the total bills to be spent to own that home that means when you calculate the total housing cost your mortgage the bills to pay everything is it less than 28 percent of your gross income and i think that's very important because that will guide you if not you'll just be working to pay your mortgage till you die and according to ramit that's not a good option the second thing to check is have you been able to save up at least 20 percent of that mortgage and that's because of course for most people that want to own houses you would have to pay a percentage now ramit is saying that you should have been able to save up 20 percent because it's not just about the 20 percent but the fact that you would have been able to build up that discipline of saving money to own your home now the third ground is are you planning to live in that place for at least 10 years which is very important because if you are an immigrant and you've not decided to settle in a particular place then owning a home may not be the best option because you need at least a minimum of 10 years to be able to stay grounded foot all your bills regarding the house this particular money lesson was called from the story of two black couple who um, basically they wanted to own a home and they had very horrible credit score like their credit score was terrible and they were still in lots of debt <laughs> in fact they are serial shoppers like they just waste money on buying like irrelevant things and yet they want to own a home and i learned that once you have a low credit score it even affects how much you're able to own a home because a person with a bad credit score would be unable to get the kind of interest rate that they desire like the worse your credit score is the higher your interest rate would be so of course a couple like that they're supposed to be concerned on increasing their finances increasing their credit score before even thinking about buying a home but because of this urge or this like keeping up with the joneses we want to buy a home when we are still in debt and of course that's like bringing more problem in the future because if you've not been able to even like do well with your finances with the little you have how are you going to <laughs> get a home and sustain it the fourth money lesson i've learned is always have a paper trail what that means is when you are having like discussions with people or anything that concerns money always keep it in writing as a lawyer i'm very conscious of the fact that evidence is the law like if there is no evidence it did not happen so once something happens ensure that you can always keep that trail i got this money lesson from sofina's story sofina is someone in how to get rich who was complaining about an issue she had in her home and she kept having like very bad conversations with the managers but nothing was in writing so rami told her send in an email and this is something that my boss does, like my manager at work. If we have a phone conversation, she will tell me, oh yeah, thank you, Aja. Pop in an email regarding our conversation. Because that's keeping a paper trail. I know some of you may have been um, victims of someone saying, oh, it's a lie, this never happened. But the only reason why they can say it never happened is because when it happened, there was no evidence, there was no paper trail, there was no email, there was nothing. It was just word of mouth. And in that case, they can always say, no, 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 I didn't say that. What's your proof? And you have no proof. The fifth money lesson would pertain a lot to lots of immigrants because it is when your financial life improves, don't just dramatically improve your lifestyle. 
and this is something called lifestyle inflation for most people that don't have money the minute they have money oh my god it is crazy like they literally forget where they're coming from and they want to burn the money they want to show everybody that you know i am the person i am the baddest whilst there is nothing wrong in that you actually have to be very careful about lifestyle inflation because the richer you get the higher it is for you to become poor i always say this like the richer you are the higher it is for you to get poor and that sounds like hmm, how is that possible like if i'm rich i should be rich no because when you're rich and your standards increase your lifestyle increases you have more opportunities of being poor because everyone like looks up to you as the rich person people ask you more for things you want to like show off and show up and of course before you know it's become poor because you became like an overnight success and you had no time to learn about how to manage money because when you learn about how to manage money you would know how to carry yourself financially you would know what to invest in and even if you want to spend and splurge you would know what to splurge on because something i learned from ramit which blew my mind when you talk about your finances most people tell you oh how can you like cut back on your spending how can you cut back on your spending ramit says something different he says what do you enjoy spending on think about it hey may i start thinking what do i enjoy spending on and he said whatever you enjoy spending on multiply it by three i'm like what so let's assume you love spending on travel multiply it by three that is you have more money to travel times three how would you feel hey i say eh because when i thought about what i enjoy spending on is they're now multiplied by three then <laughs> he said now think about how you can achieve that i'm like hmm, what can i do that i'll be able to comfortably achieve splurging that hard now that actually helps because on one hand you are able to be conscious about your spending so even if you decide to spend a lot or spend on some things it is still controlled it is still measured as against you just plodding on everything because your lifestyle has improved because you not earn more you want to splurge on everything that you see you just become as broke as you were before and it will, it would even be worse because in, imagine like improving then going back you're not going to go back on the level you were you would even go worse because now you have tasted a good life and you're back to square zero so watch that especially if you're coming from a background where you had nothing and now automatically you have something so you don't even know what to do with the money <laughs> you don't even know how to comport yourself and learn more about financial management before blowing up your money because this money thing here you have to respect money the way you treat money will determine how it stays or lives your life if you have no respect for money you will waste it the sixth lesson i learned is MLMs are scams, which of course is something I've always known. All these multi-level marketing, they will come with very nice words, very um, high expectations, like it's not a Ponzi scheme, like pyramid, like <laughs> you'll do this, you'll do that, you get uh, a car, you get a house, you get um, travel this, you get travel that. And at the end of the day, you are stuck. And this lesson was called from one of the characters in the series who was like a top executive in one MLM. Now, these people promised her like a Cadillac. They actually give her the Cadillac. But to maintain having that Cadillac, she would need to keep increasing in position or keep maintaining a particular position. And the month she goes below that, they take it out. Like, they don't pay for the Cadillac. So she gets to pay. 
and this is someone that on a normal day she won't even own a cadillac because that is above her means she would own a smaller car but they've done that to keep her stuck she will spend all her resources her time her energy getting people because this thing is like a pyramid if you don't bring people to join you you never progress you need to have downliners for you to, it's just like robbing peter to pay paul and i know that people would have strong opinions regarding this because i ah, know it's not a Ponzi scheme it's not it's not mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. i've done an mlm so i know how it works most times it benefits people that join early like once you join early you cash out after that it goes downhill from there and unless you have a lot of money <laughs> a lot of time maybe you're going to live forever and you just want to waste these things then of course go ahead but if you are serious about finances you would know better now the seventh money lesson i learned is be selfish about your goals at the very least at first and you're like hmm, selfish oh yes when you are in an airplane they tell you that in case of a crash or anything put your oxygen mask on first what that means is even if you have a child they tell you put your oxygen mask on first before you put that on anybody in how to get rich there's someone that was still struggling financially and he desperately wanted to retire his mom and Rami told him put your oxygen mask on first what you want to do is very noble you should retire your mom because you want to do that it's amazing however you are still broke you can't want to retire your mom when you can barely fend for yourself focus on yourself give yourself a time and focus on yourself make the money when you have focused on yourself you've made the money such that you have lots of investment then you can retire your mom thankfully he did that and i'm sure by now his mom is retired so besties especially a lot of us that are blacks we, we hear of black tax where once you are at the top in your family as an immigrant as a black person as a person of color everyone depends on you everyone wants to get their bread and butter from you they don't care how you're doing it they just want to get it from you and you have not even stabilized yourself on the ground you're still struggling you leave yourself to focus on others at the end of the day you're not even able to do that you drag yourself you drag like you just drag yourself down you are now broke you can't even help people that you want to help because you were not even you were not rooted to begin with so best is take out the time and i'm speaking to myself as much as i'm speaking to you in all of these money lessons because i still have like a lot to learn and that's why i'm constantly upgrading my knowledge and my actions that you know what learn to prioritize yourself because that's the best way you are even able to pour out to others you can't pour from an empty cup if you're broke you're hungry you <laughs> how do you want to help somebody when you need help help yourself first yourself further so best is if you enjoy this video i'm linking up a playlist of all my financial conversations that i think would be very helpful to you and until next time stay happy remain blessed and get all the money <laughs> bye besties Mwah.